Welcome and happy President's Day. My name is Liz Crooks. I am the director at the University of Iowa Pentecost Museums. Usually we would be gathered in the Senate chamber, but as you know, these times are far from usual. Instead, I welcome you virtually. An added bonus of that, none of us need venture out on this frigid February day to enjoy our very first virtual exhibit and opening. I also welcome many friends from around the country who would not normally be able to join us either. It is the mission of the Old Capitol Museum to educate the university, local and national communities on the continuing significance of the humanities. Design to Win does just that with its 100 year look back at presidential campaigns. I'd like to thank the Office of the Vice President for Research of which we are a part for their ongoing support of the Pentecost Museums, ever important during this pandemic. I'd like to thank my staff who have been working harder than ever over this last year. While we've been close to the public, our work to fulfill our mission and serve campus hasn't stopped as you'll soon see. Most of all, I'd like to thank our supporters. The Pentecost Museum is proud to present free educational exhibitions and programmings to our campus and surrounding communities. Your support helps to enhance our offerings, create, maintain, repair exhibits, employ students, and preserve our collections for our future and future generations. For the support, we are grateful. This afternoon, we're fortunate to have the exhibit's curator, Carolina Kaufman, and collector, J. Patrick White, with us. Carolina joined the Pentecost Museum staff in August, and we could not be happier. It is my pleasure to turn the program over to Carolina. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Liz. That was a wonderful introduction. And again, um, as Liz echoed, we want to provide um, exhibits and, uh, and, and our collection available to the public. And this is one great way that we're going to do it. Today, you will get to access this exhibit. At the end of the session, we're going to provide a link uh, that provides exclusive access. And we, have, um, we are honored to have alumnus uh, from the University of Iowa, J. Patrick White. Um, I am joined by Liz Crooks, as you just met, uh, myself, and Jillian Schrader, who is my education assistant. We cannot do these programs without our students, and Jillian is a senior now, and we're just so glad that she's part of this. Uh, just a quick reminder that you we have enabled transcription, so uh, for accessibility, you can turn on your live transcription if you'd like, or turn them off. And of course, I'm honored to have J. Patrick White. He is a longtime uh, Iowa City resident and retired Johnson County attorney at, at, in Iowa City. Uh, he received his BA and JD law degree from the University of Iowa. We're so glad to have you, Pat. Thanks, Liz. It's good to be here. And as long as we're thanking people, I, I thank you and the Pentecost Museums for the opportunity. It, it's not very often that a, a private collector like myself, unless they have a, a, an expensive collection of artworks, as an example, gets a chance to share their collection with members of the public. So, um, and thank you to all the participants for joining us today. Look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Pat. And yes, as I said, we are featuring in Pat's uh, private collection, 10 presidents. Now his collection does expand beyond just these 10 presidents that we're going to be presenting today. Uh, but because of President's Day, we wanted to feature the candidates that actually won the presidents, hence the, the, our uh, title, Designed to Win. And one of the goals is to really help examine American history through the lens of these small but very mighty pieces of American history, a sort of time capsule, if you will. And as you can see, these are just a few examples of each president that we're featuring. It's so exciting that we're going to be talking about these. We're going to look at uh, things like what the general public opinion was of the time when people had these, uh, the way that uh, the characterization or values that might have been portrayed both by the candidate and again, as worn by the voters that were interested in the candidate's views or, or believe, had the same beliefs. And we also want to think about the design and the rhetoric of these buttons, which did change over time. Uh, 
So we're going to take a little look into that as well. And of course, a couple of few unique anecdotes that uh, Patrick, uh, I wouldn't have known unless Patrick had told me. So we're going to get into that as well. You know, it's interesting. Um, actually, where did buttons come from? Well, there's always been buttons. But what's unique about these political buttons um, is they hark back quite a while. Um, but the but the what was unique about it is the uh, the technology that was created for it, which is known as a celluloid button, and the celluloid button um, goes dates back a while. Actually, celluloid was the first man-made plastic, uh, which originally was meant to be a substitute for making billiard balls, uh, for making clothing, and for making many other um, things that we would normally. Uh, that would normally be needed um, from nature. But the problem was that, of course, um, elephant tusks were being used a lot uh, to the point um, where they were afraid they might get extinct. So celluloid became a way to, as a substitution. And when the, uh, when the McKinley era, which was the first president that we're going to visit today, um, this actually uh, the celluloid button was attributed originally by this woman named uh, Amanda uh, Logie, who comes from Massachusetts. She actually had her own factory and business that she took over from her brothers out in Massachusetts. And she developed a way to create a celluloid plastic, if you will, um, uh, thin layer on top of a button that you would wear in a textile. And so um, when, the, when the elections came, by, came in in 1896, uh, these two gentlemen, Benjamin White, Whitehead and Charles uh, Chester Hogue decided they wanted to try to adopt what she had originally patented. So they got the patent for her, from her within a year, and they were the largest manufacturing of political buttons that we know today. And is really hasn't changed since, which is really interesting. So that just a little bit of history there on the on the origins the origins of the celluloid button. Another interesting thing is uh, thinking about rhetoric and symbolism, which we're going to see a lot today. People might be wondering, well, where did our uh, different um, partisan uh, parties, how did, they, how did they get started? Why are they associated with, for example, with the animals um, and with the Republican Party and the, uh, the Democratic Party? Uh, there was a famous cartoonist who sort of started the idea of, of using cartoons to uh, create um, political messaging <laughs> of the time. And if you've ever wondered where, for example, the Democratic donkey came from, it actually came from the 1828 election of Andrew Jackson. Uh, he was known to be by his colleagues as a little bit of a brute and a very, very outspoken. Uh, and so this cartoonist, uh, Thomas Nast, actually depicted him with the head of a donkey, um, sort of a jackass, if you will. And what's funny about that is that actually Andrew Jackson uh, decided to adopt it and he used it for his own campaigns. Um, so here's just a, an example of these characters that Thomas Nast created back, uh, back in the uh, um, mid 19th century. And you could see um, uh, Andrew Jackson with his head uh, uh, mounted on a donkey and he's stepping on what would be bank branches um, and with other onlookers who are also um, characterized by different animals. And so that's sort of where it all started as, as far as um, symbolism and uh, our relationship with the donkey and the elephant for both political parties. It's very interesting. Um, now I wanna turn back my attention to the collection and uh, we want to give the opportunity for Pat to give a little bit of introduction about uh, how he got started with this collection. Pat, could you share a little bit about your journey uh, with this collection? I'd be happy to. First, first of all, um, the, what you've just heard from uh, Ms. Kaufman illustrates the uh, research that's gone into this that is way beyond my, my collection <laughs> of buttons. And one of the things that's been interesting to me is the extent to which she really threw herself into this project. And um, I learned a few things. I, I originally was going to say that uh, the buttons actually started with the McKinley campaign of 1986. And Ms. Kaufman has explained the history of, of how that came to be. I first got started when I was eight years old. And I would describe that as accumulating buttons rather than collecting. My 
father was a delegate to the 1948 Democratic National Convention, which nominated Harry Truman, who was already serving, uh, having been Roosevelt's vice president. And when he and my mother came home from Philadelphia, where the convention was, he brought me a little packet of buttons, including several uh, Harry Truman buttons and some other paraphernalia from the convention, which I, I still have. And that got me started. What you see on your screen is, is a shot of my mother and a group of what I think to be uh, other Democratic officials from some time, but must have been between 1948 and 1952. I can't be sure. I think Ms. Kaufman has just shown you where my mother is. That Harry Truman is standing in front of the uh, group in a double-breasted jacket with a, a light suit coat. And that picture was taken in the Rose Garden. Um, so that was the, the beginning. And then in uh, the early 1950s, 1952 to be exact, I had a great uncle who was a um, alternate delegate to the 1952 Democratic Convention and he brought me yet more buttons. So I accumulated yet more from that convention. And, and then when I was a sophomore undergraduate, I had the uh, good fortune to meet John F. Kennedy uh, who came to Iowa City to give a speech. He was at that point beginning his campaign. He hadn't formally announced that he was a candidate for president, but I was in a small group of people at the invitation of my parents who were very active in politics, who greeted him at the Iowa City airport when he landed there at two or three in the morning on Saturday. And then later uh, that morning, he gave a speech at, in the main lounge of the Iowa Memorial Union. And that photo on the left is from his speech. And although I'm uh, hidden in the shadows uh, between his right arm and the microphone wearing a pair of glasses, I was there that morning uh, to listen to his speech. And uh, as his speech ended, he recognized me from the night before and uh, we walked out together out the east doors of the union down to a, a car that was waiting to take him away and had a conversation mostly about the prior evening. Um, the photographs you see on the right, he's, he's either coming in or leaving, you can't be sure, I think coming in to the Iowa Memorial Union, which those of you who are familiar with the union will see that there's a canopy over the east entrance, which is long gone. That was Iowa governor, then governor Herschel Lovelace with him. And then there's another photograph at the bottom of the right hand side of Kennedy and governor Lovelace in the Iowa press box, watching the Iowa Notre Dame football game where uh, he, he had famously that morning at the union said he was going to cheer for Iowa and pray for Notre Dame at the game. And uh, that line was picked up in the caption to that photograph. So I, I got involved as a 19 year old undergraduate in the uh, Kennedy campaigning uh, and accumulated a good many more buttons. Uh, probably didn't actually start collecting when I got back to Iowa City from the Air Force and uh, 1968, uh, I got involved in politics. My career has been that of government, uh, the law and politics. And I began accumulating more and gradually, I think in the, probably the early to mid seventies, it turned from accumulating into starting to collect. Um, there was a fairly long hiatus while I was uh, too busy to, uh, either invest funds or take time uh, while I was county attorney. And uh, I sort of reinvigorated my collecting interests after I retired at the end of 2006. That picture you're looking at now is a photograph of me with obviously with uh, soon to be President Barack Obama. He was at that time campaigning. That was uh, in advance of the Iowa caucuses by a few days at the Marriott Hotel in uh, Coralville. 
Uh, he had actually talked to us on the phone a couple of times. He, he called once before this, spoke on the phone with my wife, Betty, when I was not at home, and then called back later to visit with me. So we had actually spent some time on the telephone before this event. <laughs> That's wonderful, Pat. I love these stories. It just gives such great insight into not just your collection, but again, your um, your lifelong pursuit in government and law, as well as how they sort of relate with one another. So that's really great. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, now, you know, what's interesting is everybody does remember at some point or another where they might have been on a on a particular event uh, or election or, uh, for example, like Kennedy's assassination. And maybe uh, people in the audience have had their own experiences with presidential candidates in the past. We would like to get um, we would like to get some insight from the audience now. We are going to um, launch a poll and we would love to know what, when did you start voting? Um, I have them listed uh, in, um, in sort of like uh, years um, and you can see where the presidencies are. We would love to see uh, where you're coming from and your stories with presidential candidates. Great, I see a lot of people coming in. Well, people are voting. Uh, yes, people are voting. Christina, yes. We might um, add in here, there's going to be some age bias in this, that, in that until, and, and I don't remember exactly what year it was. When when I first vote, you had to be 21 to vote. Mm. And it's now 18, of course. So people who were That's right. in that era will uh, have started voting later than uh, people currently. That's right. My, well, my, my first vote, by the way, was a 19 presidential vote was in 1964 for Lyndon Johnson. OK, so I even though I campaigned for him, I was not able to vote for President Kennedy. Mm. I think my first my first was Bill Clinton uh, when he was running. That was my first time. And it was very exciting. Uh, when I was in uh, college, of course, I was 18. Did you have to be 21 during Johnson? I did. You did. OK. Uh, we're just waiting just a couple more seconds here. We have almost everyone voting. But if you uh, if you can make your uh, last minute last minute vote here and we'll get to show the audience um, where where when our audiences uh, voted for the first time. And in the back, you could see also that we have uh, uh, which will we'll, which we'll mention it later, uh, the Taft Iowa First Voters League button there. We're gonna close the poll in just a few seconds. Great, uh, let's share those results. So let's see what we got. Well, we got a lot from Nixon, Ford and Carter years. Great, um, very very memorable years. I think I was born in the Carter years. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that. We always love to find out what the audience is experiencing as well uh, when it comes to the topics and the programs that we do. So thank you. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to launch um, launch our exhibit, and Patrick is going to give a few highlights from each case. We have ten cases to go through, so Pat, we're we're going to have to keep your stories short but sweet. Um, they're definitely um, worth visiting with him. Um, so I'm going to um, switch my screen here and share um, our exhibit. Okay, so if you see, if you can see, this is our exhibit. What you're gonna be seeing for the next couple of, um, for, for the next um, 20, 30 minutes uh, is just a, a simple view of the exhibit. You will be provided an exhibit that has all the content that we included in it. Um, it includes a welcome page, which is our exhibit overview, of course, all about Patrick and this button, how you can navigate the site, and um, all the people that worked on uh, putting this together. Thank you so much. Okay, let's get started. We're gonna start with our earliest presidential candidate. Pat, would you like to, to kick it off? I, I'll be happy to, Caroline. I uh, invite you, it uh, will come as no surprise to you having worked with me. Uh, I may have a tendency to go on, so you interrupt whenever you need to, to keep us on schedule. Sure thing. I, I want to start with the, the button right in the middle that says Major William McKinley. 
Uh, McKinley is a really interesting individual. He um, served in the Civil War. He actually volunteered for the Civil War when he was 18 years old. He was a native of Ohio. And very interestingly, one of the commanders in the Ohio unit that he volunteered into was Rutherford B. Hayes, who himself would later go on to be a president. But McKinley enlisted, volunteered as a private, and he, he quickly was recognized by his superiors as having uh, abnormal above average skills. And they made him what was called a quartermaster, which meant he was in charge of uh, army union supplies. And he happened to be at the Battle of Antietam, which is the still called the bloodiest day in American history. When you count up uh, wounded and dead on both the Union and Confederates, size. He was two or three miles behind the line of battle, but he got word that there was a Union division that was without provisions, that hadn't had breakfast or lunch and had no other supplies. So he, he got a wagon together loaded with supplies against the recommendation of his superiors. He drove it right into the line of battle. The, the wagon that he was pulling suffered considerable damage, but he got supplies to this Union unit, uh, essentially saved their lives mm -hmm. and won himself uh, a promotion to sergeant by virtue of his bravery at the Battle of Antietam. And he distinguished himself elsewhere through the war and, and by the end of the war had been promoted to major William McKinley. And one of the things that he famously said throughout his later political life, he served in Congress as governor of Ohio and ultimately as president, was that he would prefer to be called Major McKinley, but he was sure he earned that rank. All others, he wasn't so sure that he had earned. <laughs> uh, and in addition to being the, the, the first real appearance of buttons, political buttons. It was also an era that through McKinley's leadership and decisions, not entirely of his own making, the United States be, became for the very first time a world power. We uh, took over as a temporary protectorate in Cuba. We gained rights to Puerto Rico, uh, to places like Guam and even Ohio. And, and one of the things that is interesting about McKinley is that he tapped a then largely unknown circuit court judge also from Ohio to be the governor of the newly acquired territory of the Philippines, William Howard Taft. Um, I'd like to, to talk for a moment about the button that's at the bottom. There it is, what we call a full dinner bucket, Juget button, Juget meaning the picture of the presidential and vice presidential candidates are on the button. Uh, there you see Theodore Roosevelt, who was McKinley's second term vice president. Garrett Hobart was his first, who had died in office, and Roosevelt was the second term. Yeah. This, this uh, dinner bucket really captures all of the, the terms of that campaign, employment for labor, a full dinner bucket, meaning uh, food for the hardworking people of America, sound money, good markets, prosperity. All of those were individual themes through the campaign. Sound money having to do with gold versus silver, w William Jennings Bryan, his opponent, being for the free coinage of silver and McKinley sticking with the gold uh, standard and mm -hmm. what he referred to as sound money. Yeah, this I really like the uh, the imagery on this one. It's actually quite detailed, and also to show sort of the period of the time of what people would carry uh, in their dinner pails to work. Um, I might I might add relative that to that button, Carolina. If people look at it closely, they'll see. Probably can tell even from this photo. It's not in great condition. It was one of the first buttons that I acquired uh, because I like the imagery and the. 
uh, slogans that are on it. And I've, I've always intended to replace it with one that's a better quality. <laughs> but since it was so early in my collection, I've stuck with the one in not very good condition. <laughs> well, it's the meaning that matters, and I'm so glad you have it. Um, there are other areas that you can explore. Once you get the link, we'll go to that. But for time, we're going to move on to the next one. And we're going into President Taft. Um, of course, the one that stands out the most to me is that really big one, which I originally thought was a button, but it's not a button. Pat, tell us just a little bit about no, what this is. It's not a, not a button. It's, two, it's also um, one of my favorite items. It's actually a tip tray from the early 1900s. <clears throat> One of the things that you really don't see anymore. Part of what I like about it, in addition to the overall imagery, and it also would be, be referred to as a jugat with both Taft and his running mate, um, Congressman from New York, referred to as Sonny Jim. You see the White House in the background. At the top, and, and this is often lost, you, you hear the Republican Party sometimes referred to as the GOP. And this is what the GOP comes from. It's more formally called the Grand Old Party. And one of the things I like about this tip tray, and it, it literally was for people to leave tips in as they were completing commercial transactions at a counter, you see the years 1856 to 1908 at the bottom, and then around both the left hand and the right hand edge, it has the name of every Republican candidate between 1856 when the Republican Party started, and John Fremont was their candidate who's the first name listed on the left, the second one being Abraham Lincoln and then yeah. making full yeah. circle to, to William Howard Taft in 1908. That's really great, Pat, thank you, yes. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Taft and the, that the button is not in this frame, but I've seen a picture of a button. He made a speech in Iowa City when he was Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of War. And the rumor is that so-called Taft Speedway, which is a road that runs along the north mm. side of the Iowa River um, was named after Taft. Thanks for sharing a little bit of local history there. That's really great. Uh, let's move on to Hoover. Now we are skipping a couple of presidents. Um, is there a reason why we're, well, we're uh, just, just so for the public to know? Well, there are a combination of reasons why these would be uh, collector's decisions. First of all, I, sh I should say the collection you're looking at it's what I would describe as a fairly pedestrian collection. They're not uh, rare items in there. Um, and, and to give you a frame of reference, an auction that I saw probably uh, four months ago included a Hoover Curtis item, a larger item, and a an accompanying Al Smith Robinson item. They were beautiful. <coughs> They sold in that auction for over $25,000 a piece. Mm. Which, um, won't be wow. finding a place in my collection anytime soon. Herbert Hoover, of course, was born, he's a fascinating story, was born about uh, 12 miles away from where I live in Iowa City in a very tiny cabin. Became an orphan at the age of eight and his ultimate business and political success is uh, just a marvelous story. Um, the, the larger Hoover thing item at the bottom is an armband. You can see where it would hook together as an armband. And the larger striped item at the top uh, with uh, Hoover and, and uh, Charles Curtis, who had been a Senator from Kansas, it actually was a sewing kit inside of it. There, there you see uh, an example of it in, inside <laughs> of it. There, there were a variety of these in different states, yeah. but it actually had needle and thread in the, uh, in, in the inside in addition to, to a full slate of Republican candidates in the particular yeah. jurisdiction that this one came out of. 
I think I should also add, Pat, that this was the time when women started voting. So they were making yeah. campaign materials that would um, be of interest to obviously women, but also soldiers were carrying these around in their pockets. So um, campaigns were getting creative of how they wanted to reach. Uh, and uh, would you like to talk about this one real quick? The uh, Christian in the White House. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a unique one. It illustrates uh, uh, path of American history. In 1928, Herbert Hoover's opponent was the governor of New York. His name was Al Smith. He was a Catholic, and that brought immense nationwide debate over whether a Catholic would be more devoted to his religion and the Pope than he would be to the American people. And there, there were people who absolutely campaigned against a Catholic being in the White House. And this button picks up on that theme. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, it, it describes Hoover as a Christian and implies that Al Smith as a Catholic is not, which of yeah. course is, is not true, but it illustrates the tenor of the times. Now, uh, 32 years later, when Jack Kennedy was a candidate, Catholicism was still a topic of debate. Um, but today, Joe Biden has now served about uh, a month. He's a Catholic, and I didn't see any mention of his Catholicism anywhere in the campaign. Mm illustrating that sometimes it takes a while, but the country yeah. will eventually get to the right place. This is what I think makes these somewhat time capsules because we have these sentiments sort of put out there. Absolutely. Let, Absolutely. Let's they, move they on to- in every uh, sense of the word, a window yeah. into American history. When, right. Let's move on to Roosevelt. Now he's got 12 years. I don't know how you're gonna sum this up in three minutes, but go for it. <laughs> well, it's, it's not, not possible to do. He was- uh, <laughs> Elected in 19, he'd been the uh, uh, governor of New York. Um, interestingly, th this is a, a trivia question that our participants can take away. He's one of two people who were was on the presidential ballot five times. And the reason for that, he was elected president four times from 1932 to 1944, but he was also the Democratic candidate for vice president with Ohio Governor James Cox in 1920. And one of the things that makes Roosevelt's story remarkable is that after that 1920 campaign in 1921, he was stricken with polio, mm. which is almost thanks to uh, vaccinations, uh, which are needed today for another reason. But polio is almost obscure today but it made Roosevelt a total paraplegic. He could not walk after 1921. The, the appearance of walking came only with the aid of very heavy steel braces and one or two people on each arm. He developed the ability to appear to be walking, moving forward only a step or two. But the fact that a paraplegic was our president during coming out of the depression during war, World War II and elected four times is a remarkable story. Mm -hmm. um, you see three ribbon pins in this frame that are from the 1940 election where an Iowan was his vice presidential candidate, Henry Wallace. Um, and, and a lot of these uh, ribbon buttons have a donkey on them. <laughs> but uh, the, the fact that Wallace was his running mate was his uh, Iowa's uh, entrance into the Roosevelt uh, four terms. And mm. Roosevelt in 1944 decided he didn't want to keep Wallace, ostensibly thinking he was too progressive or too liberal, which may have been true for the tenor of the times mm -hmm. and, and picked Harry Truman. Uh, one of the things about the Roosevelt frame, if you look at multiple pictures of Roosevelt, <coughs> starting with that black and white button at the top, you get some sense of how he aged between when he was first a candidate in 32 mm -hmm. and when he won 
reelection for the fourth time in 1944. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of this frame, you see what I refer to as slogan buttons. His race against Wendell Wilkie was heavily populated by slogan buttons on both sides. Roosevelt probably had fewer of these slogan buttons than Wilkie did, uh, but uh, Roosevelt had his share of them. And there you see an example of, of negative campaigning with Roosevelt having buttons that actively attempt to denigrate Wendell Wilkie, who was uh, in, in and of himself was a very interesting individual. Mm. Thank you, Pat. Um, and also just a small antidote. This is the first time that we see a smiling candidate uh, uh, depicted. We haven't seen any smiling. It's actually, he sort of starts that uh, new trend. And what does that say about uh, how candidates are viewed or their leadership style? Um, it's up to sort of the eye of the beholder, but uh, a very interesting small thing there. I'm well, gonna, it, for the, ta oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It also, it also Carolina, probably reflects a movement forward in politics and that you'll see more smiles yeah. in later buttons. Thank you, Pat, for adding that. And we're going to move on to some uh, floating heads here of smiling candidates, uh, a trend well, in <laughs> the 50s. Floating heads, but also while, while this whole frame is up, one of the observations that you, you make looking at this one and the ones we've just looked at is you see much more red, white, and blue in this frame than you've seen before. And that will show up in frames going forward as well. Um, Richard Nixon is in these buttons uh, substantially. And what uh, Carolina referred to as floating heads are buttons where literally nothing other than the head of the candidate <laughs> appears, sort of in the middle of this frame, I can dick and vote Republican. You see just their, their heads rather than the more traditional head and shoulders buttons. Uh, it becomes very difficult to tell sometimes whether which campaign things are from. Ike ran and was elected both in 1952 and 1956. Mm -hmm. You can tell for certain that the one in the toward the upper left hand corner where he's in uniform was in 1952, where he's coming out of his military service in World War II, leading the D-Day invasion on June 6, 1944. Mm -hmm. he, he was a very popular figure. In fact, the uh, Democrat, there was a democratic movement in 1948 attempting to draft him to be the Democratic nominee. And there's a story, in, a story that in 1952, when Truman decided not to run, that he went to Eisenhower. Now this story has largely not been confirmed by either Truman or Ike, but supposedly Truman went to Eisenhower and promised him his support if he would <coughs> run as a president as a Democratic candidate, excuse me. Um, one of the interesting buttons here on the right side, again, it has a uh, hotspot on it. I think Christina can call it up showing a black and white handshake in front of my oh, yeah. friend. friend yeah, I. that's an important one. And, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Here again, this is a, a significant window into the progress of American history. Obviously, the, the country is still struggling with racial issues. And this was an attempt by the Eisenhower campaign to portray Ike as uh, making progress with, with racial issues. And there was some degree of truth in that, but uh, he was yeah. trying to, he appeared to have been trying to walk a tightrope between the Southern state support that he had and racial issues. For example, Eisenhower actually sent troops to Little Rock, Arkansas, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, try to prevent violence in the integration of their school system. 
And it is generally thought that his decision to send troops was more an effort to keep violence down than it was to integrate uh, blacks into the yeah. Rock School District. He was president when the United States Supreme Court issued its famous Brown versus Board of Education decision requiring desegregation of the schools. Yeah, th um, thanks for bringing that up because it's it's the first time we see sort of um, uh, sort of a, a, a talking point towards um, race and equality and uh, we don't see that a lot beforehand. Um, so that, that makes this button really unique. Uh, for the sake of time, we do need to move on. So um, yes. we had, we were going to highlight another one. We might be able to do it at the end. I see that. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to Kennedy. Can you think of one thing that you would like to highlight in Kennedy? Well, the, the, the one that I like to highlight the most is the uh, PT boat pen that is in the middle of the frame that you, you've called up there. It's a fairly small button. Kennedy who came from a very well-to-do family, but en enlisted uh, at a very young age in the Navy uh, when World War II broke out. And he became the captain of uh, what is called the PT boat, which is a small boat <coughs> that was patrolling the Pacific Ocean. And the story behind this pen actually was turned into a movie and became fairly famous. The, the boat that he captained was knifed in two by a Japanese destroyer. His crew swam to safety and he, using his belt, pulled one of his crew members, the belt in his teeth while he swam to shore. Uh, so they were on this uh, deserted island mm -hmm. and the story gets better yet because he scratched on a coconut a message that they needed to be rescued and that coconut was later returned to him and he actually put it on his desk in the Oval Office. But this very pen, um, Kennedy gave to my mother in 1959 when he came to Iowa City. He carried, and I think in one suit pocket, uh, he carried tie clasps with the same PT boat uh, image and I think he gave those to men and in his other suit pocket, he carried these pen, which he gave to women. So this particular one is, although there are many of them out there, if you're uh, interested in acquiring one, <laughs> this one is very special to me and that it was given personally to my mother by Kennedy himself. Thank you for sharing that, Pat. That is a very special story. Um, I think I'll, if I, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this one button that I'd like to quickly talk about because of time. Um, I, I love this button only because I can read it. <laughs> I speak Spanish and Viva, um, Viva Kennedy. And also um, Kennedy wanted to reach out to Latino voters, um, but the Lat but he also looked to um, Latino activists, both um, in sort of the um, the California based area and then Puerto Ricans um, and uh, or New Yorkans in New York uh, were starting to form their own clubs of uh, Viva Kennedy clubs. Um, so this, these are just two small buttons, great examples of how Kennedy and his wife who did speak Spanish um, reached to those audiences and rally support. Carol so. Carolina, uh, one of the, can we talk about uh, how history evolves, one of the things mm -hmm. that uh, piggybacks on that message is if you look behind Joe Biden when he's in the Oval Office now, he has placed a bust of Cesar Chavez. And oh, really? The, these Kennedy buttons huh. are, the, I, I think, the first time you see an attempt to reach out to that community. And now, um, 70 years later, a bust of one of the migrant farm worker leaders in California from the, that movement is uh, in the Oval Office. Mm. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. Wow. We still have quite a bit of presidents to go to, but we do have our Q&A. Um, we have about five more minutes, actually, um, and to allow the audience to ask questions. Um, we um, want to make sure that we can maybe highlight one thing out of the case because of, we're running out of time. And if there are questions that we don't get to at the end towards the Q&A, Pat is willing to stay a couple minutes longer afterwards to um, maybe go back to some of these or ask, answer questions that are unanswered. Answered. Predictably, I've talked too long, Chris, Christina, but or Carolina, but uh, <laughs> the one I'd like to talk just for a few seconds about is the one on the far left side labeled all the way with LBJ. Yeah. When I first acquired this, it was listed as an LBJ button. I now think it may be a, a Goldwater button because I've, uh, with Ms. Kaufman's uh, assistance, I've done some research and found this button <coughs> listed as a Goldwater button and a button with a similar image saying go for Goldwater and Johnson buttons. But this this draws on probably the most famous presidential campaign commercial in um, the 20th century history, which is the so-called Daisy commercial. It was an LBJ commercial showing a little girl picking petals off a daisy and then ending with a nuclear explosion. And his message was that Goldwater was going to endanger the world, uh, couldn't be depended on to keep us safe. And uh, so I, I think it's a significant button, uh, regardless of whether I, it was initially mislabeled. Thank you, Pat. Uh, we're going to move on to Nixon. Something you would like to highlight in Nixon? Well, fa fa fascinating individual. One of the things yeah. about this frame is there are actually three campaigns, and he's the second half of the trivia question I mentioned earlier. <laughs> he's he's the second individual who was on the ballot five times, two times as Eisenhower's vice presidential candidate, one time in 1960 against Kennedy when he lost, and then two times in 68 and 72 when he won. One of the interesting things about this frame is you see a couple of buttons with his wife, Pat, at the bottom, the one on the left being from the 1960 campaign, and the one on the right being from either the 68 or 72 campaign. And you, you can simply tell by the age of the uh, uh, pictures. But uh, occasionally, Campaigns choose to portray the spouses of candidates. And, and I, I've actually seen uh, Doug Emhoff, who's Kamala Harris's spouse, pictured on a couple buttons out of the, the last the 19, uh, 2020 campaign. But of course, the uh, one of the fascinating things about this frame is it pictures Spiro Agnew, who's the only vice president who ever had to resign the vice presidency in disgrace. And, and this is another trivia point. I don't know how many people picked up on the fact that Joe Biden is now the 46th president, but Kamala Harris is the 49th vice president. And, and the reason for that is FDR changed vice presidents his last two terms. And then in uh, 1973, Spiro Agnew resigned and was succeeded by Gerald Ford. So we've actually had three more vice presidents than we've had presidents. Um, Gerald Ford, who you're now looking at, was picked as the vice president. Interestingly, the first time the 25th Amendment had been used for this purpose in other situations, uh, going back to McKinley as an example, or uh, Lyndon Johnson, when they took over as vice president because of the death of the president, we had no vice president. So the next in position to become president would have been the Speaker of the House. And uh, that was rectified with the adoption of the 25th Amendment. And this date that you see on this button, August 9th of 1974 is the day that Richard Nixon's resignation was effective in a very few minutes after noon on that day, Gerald Ford took the oath of office. And the phrase you see there comes from his first speech. 
uh, telling the country that our long nightmare is over, meaning Nixon's mm -hmm. association with the so-called Watergate break-in. Yeah. Uh, Ford is himself a very interesting personal story. Uh, Ford is his adopted father's name rather than his birth name. And it, it's also interesting that using the uh, 25th Amendment, he picked Nelson Rockefeller, who's pictured in a button at the right-hand side of this frame to be his vice president after he became president. But then when he became a candidate in 1976, he chose Robert Dole, Senator from Kansas to run with him rather than Rockefeller. And our last president. George H.W. Have... Bush. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I remember collected, him. I collected this frame. Uh, I, I put the frame together somewhat after his death. I, I think he can be described as a true gentleman who devoted himself to public service, although uh, for the family he's from, he, he didn't need to. This frame includes a button from his father's Connecticut campaign for the US Senate, which you see there. His father, Prescott Bush, became a very close friend of Dwight Eisenhower's. In the lower right-hand corner, uh, you see a not a not a pin, but a trading card. When uh, George H. W. Bush decided to uh, try to free the small Arabian country of Kuwait from Iraqi's invasion and control of its oil fields, there were uh, trading cards produced for so-called Operation Desert Storm. And uh, I decided that was unique enough that I would include that in this particular yeah. frame. There was actually, I think, um, quite a number of them. It would include uh, like uh, Saddam Hussein and Dick Cheney, and it was a whole set really, and, and you can actually still buy them. Um, so this is just wonderful. I, I, I can't believe that we've gone, uh, you know, 25 minutes <laughs> over the course of all these presidents' time. We want to open up the floor for any questions, and um, you can either ask by raising your hand. I have my assistant Jillian paying attention to that. Uh, Jillian, are there any questions that uh, people either have raised their hands for that we can that we can uh, share? I've been helping Jillian out with the questions, and great. I I do have some to kick off. First of all, I'd like to thank you both. These anecdotes have really brought the exhibit to life. I, I've already spent a lot of time with it, but this was so enjoyable to hear all of these stories. And, you know, we're getting lots of comments from folks that they're enjoying them too. I know some people are, their lunches are probably uh, coming to a yeah. close, but if you can stay, please feel free to join us. We'll, we'll get to these questions. And if you are in the audience and you do have questions, use that Q&A button at the bottom of the display screen to get those questions to us. The first one I, a viewer asked, and I have the same question, is for Pat, and how do you feel about seeing your buttons in this format? Um, what do you think about the virtual adaptation? Is it special to see it displayed this way? Do it's, you... uh, it's very interesting. I mean, th there's, they're not as vivid, but um, I, th I think uh, Ms. Kaufman has done an excellent job of putting this exhibit together. And when I first started seeing the frames pictured, uh, I was enthused about it and, and still am. Well, I will say that uh, it's not very often that we're a, uh, presented with a collection that is uh, curated and cared for in this way by the collector. And another question that we have is, uh, do you display your buttons at home? Do you keep them packed away? Um, when they're not on the screen, what are, they, what are your buttons doing? Well, they used to be in cigar boxes. One of the... One of the things that I decided after I, I retired was that, you know, this really doesn't make sense that they're uh, in a bookshelf downstairs in cigar boxes that I, I ought to put them in a 
some sort of format that they can be displayed. These particular frames are easily acquired for all sorts of collections. They're what I would refer to as uh, butterfly boxes. When I first started collecting and, and framing, I used some shadow boxes, which I still have some in, but uh, these, these boxes turn out to be a, a much more adaptable uh, format for, for displaying them. Wonderful. Uh, another viewer asked, uh, after you transitioned from what you described as being an accumulator to a collector, did you uh, start seeking out particular buttons or if you found yourself with buttons that really didn't fit what you were collecting, did you trade them? Uh, how does that, how, how do, how does the world of political button collecting work? Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily the best example of how it works because I'm uh, somewhat distant. There, there is an organization called the American Political Items Collectors, which I think will uh, be repeated on a frame at the end that people can join and, and begin to get subscriptions from them. They publish a very classy magazine four times a year that has lots of ads for dealers and sites. And then there's a monthly um, newsletter that, that comes out that also lists current developments. Uh, the uh, collection has changed since I started. It's now a very heavy, heavily inter internet uh, and their auction sites. And different people collect different items. Some focus on one or more candidates, some focus trying to collect every button that exists for certain candidates. Mine is more general and uh, includes only 10 presidents. I also collect uh, unsuccessful nominees. Um, but I think it's fair to say there's some choice involved in this. These are people who I took an interest in um, and they're, uh, they're, they're really is a lot more to be done. If, if I, I'm running out of years to do it in, so I don't know how much further I'll get. But you, you, there are also shows that you can go to around the country. And if you begin to get any of these newsletters, you'll see where they are. And people do trade them or, or buy them at shows. There's actually a national convention every other year of the, of the American political items collectors that uh, this coming year is going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm. Uh, but there are, there are shows around the country probably once a month if anybody wants to take that degree of uh, interest. I've not, I've not had the time to do that. Uh, here, here's a question that someone asked that it's, a, it's an interesting question to me. Do you have a favorite or one that's most prized? Well, favorite frame would probably be Kennedy's frame because of the contact that I had with them. I also have a, a different, we didn't see it today because it's in a different, it's in one of these shadow boxes. Uh, my uh, collection of Jimmy Carter buttons is um, somewhat prized because I, uh, Betty and I both talked to him on the telephone. In fact, this is a very odd story, Liz. I'm, I'm going to take up a couple more minutes. Um, I arranged for him. I was involved in his reelection campaign in 1980 and arranged for him to call a small household gathering we were having. Only he called on the wrong day. He called in the middle of an Iowa-Wisconsin basketball game. We had a nice <laughs> visit. But... but uh, it took some uh, chutzpah to do this, but I said, Mr. President, uh, this is actually the wrong day. Would you mind calling back on Tuesday night, which was the night we had? He said, no, no he'd be happy to. And he jotted down <laughs> name and phone number. And he was in the, in the White House at the time he made both of these calls. And he, he called back on Tuesday night. So I, ha I have some affinity for um, Carter. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it. We have a, a question that you may or may not know the answer to, but it, it's one that I've been wondering about too. As we watch Kamala Harris uh, break so many barriers 
uh, for women and minorities and others as uh, her swearing in as vice president. We're reminded that Hoover's vice president was a Native American. And uh, there was recently a story on CBS's Sunday morning about that. Are you aware at the time if that was an issue or if people talked about that? I'm not, I'm not. It, it was not an issue to my knowledge. Um, obviously he'd been elected as a, a U.S. Senator from Kansas. So um, he had For certainly many, gone- For many, years. He'd certainly, yeah, he was a long time uh, Kansas Senator. He had gone through the political give and take if that was ever an issue. Right. But uh, I can't, I don't have any knowledge of that. Uh, and here's maybe a, a good question to wrap up on. Uh, what do you think uh, the future of political buttons will be? Do you see them continuing on? Do you see their popularity waning? Um, what is your impression? You know, it's, uh, it's hard to predict. I, certainly there have been a lot of changes. One of the changes that's taken place since I began collecting even is there are a lot more commercially produced buttons and uh, you can, th there's a question about standards and what really is a button that represents a candidate and what is a button that somebody has just produced to try to make a buck on. Uh, it used to be that the standard <laughs> was a button produced by the candidates organization themselves, but that began to change in the 1970s with uh, the advent of commercially produced buttons. And for some people, the standard became was a button used or worn at a candidate's event. And of course, this year, using the Biden campaign as an illustration, there were way fewer events. Um, and so I think it's an open question as to what the future holds in terms of the nature of events, how much will be virtual, how much will be yeah. Uh, populated by individuals, whether they'll return to the old ways. I, I think it's just hard to tell. Well, it's exciting for me as a museum professional to see the, these things that are collected that we call them ephemera, things that were never meant to last more than their brief period of usage. And, and here we have ribbons dating back a uh, hundred years, you know, other campaign materials dating back even further. And and so it's exciting to think about what may happen in the future and what sorts of new collectibles there will be that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, I'm sure candidates a uh, hundred years ago never thought that uh, we'd see some of the campaign materials we see now. So that's an, an exciting prospect for me. Liz, uh, can, I, can I take a minute to pick up on that thought also? One of the things that makes collecting today unique is the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and I came to the internet and computers very late. They didn't even exist when I was in law school. But one of the things that fascinated me about this project is Miss Kaufman found newspaper stories. That if you think back to the McKinley frame at the large, at the right-hand side of that frame is a fairly large parade button which was a, an event that occurred much more in the 1800s than it would be today. But she has a parade button from Chicago and she actually found news stories talking about that parade. And so today's collector actually has the ability to do research on the internet to find out lots more about the individual items and certainly about candidates. Um, there it is, the Chicago Businessmen's Sound Money Parade. Um, was Can amazing, I... amazing to me that she was able to locate <laughs> newspaper stories. Thank you, Pat. I actually really enjoyed, I, I love digging for these things. I guess that's the art historian in me to look for symbolisms and see what's out there. Um, I do want to interject and just allow, because it's a little after one, um, we are going to share the public version of the site uh, right now. It's going to be in the chat. And just so everybody's aware, to answer uh, one, one person's question, um, to acknowledge their question, 
all the information for each of the buttons you don't see here in our presentation, but you will see in the public version. It'll look somewhat akin to this where you'll click on something and you'll get more information. And all some a lot of those personal anecdotes that we shared are in there as well. I know people asked about that. So, so um, we're excited to share that and make it, it, it's live now. So very, very exciting. Well, as our time comes to a close, I'd like to take a moment to thank Pat, particularly for his patience. It was uh, a very different time and much warmer out when we began to yes, talk about so this much. exhibit and what <laughs> thank it you. might look like and thank where you, it Liz. might be displayed at, at the Old Capitol Museum. And um, of course, then the pandemic happened and uh, we, we kind of sputtered and stopped and started, but uh, yeah. you hung in there with us and I am eternally grateful for that. I, I think this is a delightful exhibit. I'm very proud that this is our first fully virtual exhibit while some of our other physical exhibits have been converted to a virtual format. This one was designed to be virtual and, and uh, it will always be special to us. Yeah. I thank Carolina for her tireless work on this exhibit and all of her research and great organizing and keeping us, the rest of us, hurting us <laughs> as, as the cats we are, keeping us all together and keeping us on track and being able to present this to you today. Um, a lot of that falls to Carolina and, and the rest of the staff that helped with research and editing and design and photography. It, I yeah. foolishly thought that a virtual exhibit would be so much simpler than a physical exhibit, mm -hmm. but as it turns out, it's just as complicated, only in different ways. So yeah. we've all learned a lot on this. Here's a link to our exhibits page. Uh, Which will be on the chat. Museums.uiowa.edu. You'll see a link there to uh, hard one not done a century's worth of struggle, examining the struggle of women's rights and the struggles that continue today. Um, you'll see Design to Win that is now fully loaded and up for you to peruse. And um, in the next day or so, we'll also be able to publish the IIHR exhibit that features their centennial anniversary. So we invite you to join us virtually yeah. until you can join us in, in person. So yeah, thank you everyone. Th Thank you everyone. And just so you know, there are more opportunities that Liz talked about. You saw the exhibitions page where uh, Design to Win is. Also there's the programs page for the latest upcoming uh, programs that we're gonna have. Please vis visit it. They're mostly free. Um, our, we have a virtual game night that Jillian, my assistant is running. There's gonna be a lot of great opportunities and different ways that you can participate. And we're just so glad you can take your lunch today uh, to be with us. So thanks again. Um, we're going to stay a couple more minutes with Pat for those that really want their ans questions answered that didn't get their answers because I know we have a couple more, uh, but we are going to stop this recording. And again, thank you for coming. We're so glad that you could be with us today on President's Day. Um, so once the recording has